Good morning and welcome. This is Cheche, the show where opinion counts, live on Citizen TV. I'm Uroka Mimo. Now these are interesting, confusing and unprecedented times for us here in Kenya. Later this morning, the High Court will, is will issue its determination on whether Dr. Ekuru Okot, flag bearer of the Fairway Alliance, will be included on the repeat presidential uh, election ballot paper for uh, October 26th. However, the announcement yesterday evening by NASA flag bearer Rilo Odinga that the coalition was, in his words, vacating its presidential candidate uh, nature throws that poll into doubt. No one knows with any certainty what this means for our democracy or what happens next, but we will try to understand these developments from the perspective of political science and how we in the media can make sense of these times we find ourselves in. So our guests are Dr. Wanjiru Kamal Rutenberg, Director of AWARD, which is the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development Organization. She's also an academic and has taught political science. We have with us Dr. Nancy Booker, Senior Lecturer in Communication at the Aga Khan University, and Charles Nyachaya, former Chairman of the Constitution Implementation Commission. He contested the Kisi Senate position on a Jubilee ticket and is in demand, I guess, because of your previous role in the CIC. We also have with us our panelists, Ntegin Jao and Charles Odiambo, who are both of Real Media Services. So good morning and welcome to Cheche. Um, would you all start with you? Because there are all sorts of opinions, legal and otherwise, circulating about our current electoral predicament. From your perspective as a political scientist, what's going on? I think the most important thing to pay attention to is that this is a long game. Processes of democratization, which is what I studied in particular. Processes, processes of democratization take on average 60 years. So we as Kenyans need to not be as impatient as sometimes we get. This is a long game. We're planting trees in whose shade we will not see. However, that doesn't mean decisions that get made now, especially around institutions, don't matter. This is a wet concrete moment for us. But I think rather than focusing on the theatrics and the drama of politicians, Focusing on politics, what I call politics with a big P, politics of institutions, the role that institutions play as referees of these processes, that is what's going to really matter. So where are we now if you say that democratic transitions take 60 years? There must be stages, phases. Where are we? Yes, yeah, so political scientists uh, understand a four-stage process in democratization. First is the opening, and this is where there's contestations within the ruling party about the way the game should go. So if you think about, for example, repeal of Section 2A of the Constitution, that was a big mo opening yeah. moment for us. So I would really start that clock for us, that 60-year clock, in the 90s, early 90s. So if you think about how far out we're going, next came a breakthrough moment. And that for us was the election that saw pres President Moy out in the new Democratic... 2002. In 2002. So that was our breakthrough moment. The moment we're in now is called the transition moment. And it is a moment where where institutions become strengthened, where all focus really need to, needs to be on the IABC, the courts, the police as an institution, the referees of the game. And then the final moment is consolidation. And consolidation is where democracy gets, gets accepted as the only game in town. So I think we've gone through the first two stages. I think we've done it successfully. Um, but consolidate, um, the transition process, which is on average a 10 to 15 year process, a 10 to 15 year process where we will argue about the role of each and every institution, and we, we, we're doing it, right? We're arguing about the role of the courts. We're arguing about the power between the courts, the executive, and, and the um, legislature. legislature. These are all the <coughs> contestations that we need to work out, and the things we decide now will determine whether we consolidate or not. Now, 45% of all democratizing countries have at least one episode of rolling back. If you can survive for the first 12 years of that process, chances are the rollbacks will not be permanent. So there's... Attention. Yes. Mr. Nichai, um how do you... What, what is your conception of this um, crisis that we 
you know, everyone tells us that we're in. Is it legal? Is it political? Is it constitutional? What is, w w what's going on here? Uh, uh, probably like, uh, a bit of both. I think that uh, there are legal issues to be addressed. There are constitutional issues to be understood and common ground to be found. Um, the thing about the, the, the constitution and, and the law, uh, in, in any scenario, it, uh, contrary to what many uh, perhaps non-lawyers uh, think, it's, it's never that clear, it's never uh, completely without um, uh, some, some basis for which there can be uh, uh, arguments to and fro. Uh, that said, uh, the beauty about the scenario we're in is that uh, whatever the issue, we have a constitution, uh, the 2010 constitution, uh, which will either give us a ready answer within the constitution or which will give us a, a process by which to uh, get the answer that, that, that we need to get. So from where I sit, I do not see a, um, a, a legal or constitutional crisis as such. Um, do you see a crisis? I really don't see a crisis, but I see a scenario where we could we could have some level of political contestation. I don't see a crisis because uh, we have, uh, as I say, we have uh, 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 ways of dealing with any constitutional or legal issue that arises, and they will always arise at every stage. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Booker, um, unprecedented times for the country. Uh, we in the media, the fourth estate, we have a role to inform and educate uh, people about what's going on. How do you think we have done so far? Oh, I think we've done fairly well. Um, Scorecard out of ten? Uh, I'd be hesitant to score media <laughs> on the scale of one to ten. But now that you ask, um, I think we're at 50 percent. 50? Yes. That's just a pass. That's just a pass and, and there's a reason to that and I'm looking at you know how media has covered this whole election election period right from you know early in the year the campaigns the election and the subsequent uh, ruling by the Supreme Court and the situation that we find ourselves in right now. Um, you know, they've the, earned the 50 percent and rightly so because I think for the first time media was very intentional in terms of providing space for different political parties to be able to articulate, uh, you know, their agenda for the country and, you know, very intentional about it so much so that if you watched one station or looked at a particular newspaper on one day, they led with a particular candidate and the subsequent day led with a different candidate. So that intentionality was there. In terms of providing space for different players, I think we've seen, for example, you know, the space that has been provided for women candidates or electoral contestants uh, in, the, in, in this whole political dispensation, that has been provided. Um, in terms of, you know, putting the election agenda and the political agenda at the fore of discussion, that was also done because, you know, elections have dominated media coverage over the last couple of months. Uh, where we have fallen short, and I say we because I am part of it as a media trainer myself and having been, you know, having worked in, in the media um, space, is that, um, you know, the public has felt that there are certain things that we haven't done right. And uh, we need to listen to that voice with a lot of sobriety. <coughs> what are some of the things that we haven't done? We have, you know, questions about selective omission of certain, you know, coverage of certain stories. Going in depth into reporting, you know, a lot of it has been very conventional rather than investigative or interpretative reporting. And a good case in point is last evening. You know, I sat down and as there, many of the Kenyans, you know, wondering what does this mean? And you turn on to media to try and see whether there would be any answers. You know, so um, uh, getting into a lot of more in-depth reporting uh, as we go into this uh, uncharted uh, waters would be something that we would expect. Mm -hmm. And that's the missing 50%. Um, I'll come to the panelists. Charles, um, uh, we have two Charles's on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Charles of Yambo. Okay. <laughs> and for the purposes of this conversation, you will be Mr. Ch <laughs> 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 um, so, so Charles, um, your namesake here doesn't see us as being in, in crisis. And there are those who think that we are. Um, some see it as legal, some see it as political. What do you see? What do you make of 
everything that's going on at the moment. The mere fact that we have a sacrosanct document, a constitution, makes us not be in any crisis. Because as far as Kenyans are concerned, all answers, legal or otherwise, lie in the provisions of the constitution. Now where the challenge comes is what uh, uh, Dr. Ali had alluded to. The and so we have two doctors oh, on the the <laughs> <laughs> uh, Where she had alluded to about the big P and the small P. The big P, the institutions, clearly in Kenya are being dictated to or being determined by the small P, the politicians. Sadly again, like um, uh, the other doctor has talked about uh, the media being 50% uh, successful. The challenge we have in Kenya is that uh, the public expects the media to provide all answers to all the questions that they have. And the public only perceives the media as being right to the extent that they drum the tunes they want to hear. Any time a media house picks on Udwa Kamimo and brings her out clearly, this is her, this is what she does, the people who are pro Udwa will think that media house is being biased. So that particular journalist, they start looking at the second name. And so if we are in any crisis, to me, it's a moral and ethical crisis. It's not a legal or constitutional crisis. Okay. Like I said a few weeks ago, I think she's talking about four stages of uh, uh, democratization. And this she calls a transition. The problem with this transition is that those institutions that we want to build, we are uh, not trusting them. We, the, the biggest problem I think we have is trust. Nobody trusts anybody else, whether it's uh, the Ethics and the, the Corruption Commission, whether it's the, the, the Kaparos Institution, whether it's uh, the Auditor General. Mediation. We don't trust institutions. So my worry is, if there's the institution which are going to sort our problems, including the Constitution, if we don't trust them, then how, how do we go ahead? Uh, Mr. Chai says the Constitution is there. But if you look at the lawyers, the way they're interpreting the same document, he comes with the same document, he has got one. His interpretation will be very different from another lawyer. Who and we saw that last night because you we were here on Citizen. Actually, TV somebody TV. says lawyers mm -hmm. in Kenya are talking about the constitution like drunkards read the Bible. <laughs> the only book they read is Timothy, where it says something about take a little for your stomach and nowhere else. <laughs> and when it comes to the media, the same we have a major problem. And not even about the newspaper, the analysis. When you go to radio, vernacular, vernacular radio station, that's, 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 that's a terrible place. I, I listen to vernacular with the ones I can understand. If it is a true language thing, they are this, if they, 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 are, they are not objective. They are talking as if they, they represent that tribe, not considering that they are there to speak a language to Kenyans. And incidentally, Udo, because I, I, I relate a lot with the vernacular radio stations, I was, the looking, at the, yeah, I was looking at the latest uh, uh, audience survey report, and it indicates that most of the stations whose audience has grown in the last two months are mm -hmm. stations who care less about what they say, as long as they champion the cause of the candidate mm. their audience perceives is the right candidate. Mm. And that, that in itself presents uh, you know, a problem. Because then, uh, you know, the whole question about uh, impartial reporting and impartial coverage uh, comes to bear. Uh, and, you know, as he rightly puts it, uh, vernacular radio stations have been very successful because they speak, you know, the language that the people want. Uh, uh, but they hear. also seem to mobilize. And they also run to mobilize around their vernacular around platform. their vernacular, you know, stations. I, you know, I get called by my mother after she's listened to a vernacular station and I say, well, that's not it. And she says, no, we've had it on the radio station. Mm -hmm. What is it that's pushing media to that particular space? And one of them could, one of, one of the reasons could be the challenges of, you know, advertising and the business models in media that have existed over time. And I think one of the things that has been very evident, uh, you know, even when you're not talking about vernacular media, but you're talking about the other uh, media that is in urban settings such as this, is that part of the challenge challenge is uh, where do we draw our financial base from and once we look at advertising as the only m revenue stream then it has a lot of dictates in terms of the kind of content that we are seeing when you look at the period just you know during the campaigns there's been a lot of debate about the kind of adverts that the media was carrying I remember you know the Saturday just before the election 
all the TV stations had, you know, a paid advert of a particular, um, you know, gubernatorial candidate, and it didn't matter what station you were watching, it was their, uh, you know, their announcement that was running. And you understand, you know, from a financial point of view, that yes, it's bringing in the money, but, you know, media's role is much bigger than that. And, and I think one of the things that has, you know, this has, has led to is that it's time that we started thinking about the new business models that would be able to uh, allow media to operate in that impartial space that we are looking at. We're talking about long time ago. <coughs> mm -hmm. When I was in a, new, uh, a news editor, <coughs> I remember we used to ref refuse. I remember one day I refused an ad from a, a, a candidate uh, if it was insultive or, or abusive or slanted or, or not objective. I would refuse it. Uh, there was a time when editors mm. were not in bed with the management. If you are editor in chief, they used to be called editor in chief. I remember like George Gizei. He would say, I don't, it's not about money. Even if there is advertising, I remember once we refused, uh, we, we objected to a story being uh, killed because of uh, Kanyakana at that time, a company called Kanyakana. Simply because they were advertising, they, they threatened to cancel the advertising, they, they, they can go to hell with the advertising and continue writing the story. That, those kind of, life, that life is no longer there. <coughs> Every editor is asked by the board, <laughs> bottom line. We didn't care about bottom line at that time. We cared and about how does that bottom policy. line then bring us to where we are today, where we feel, um, parts of the country feel that we're in crisis, um, where a presidential candidate has pulled out of a mandated um, uh, a repeat presidential poll? What is our contribution to where we find ourselves? I think our contribution is uh, going back to what uh, Mr. Nyachai said. We have a constitution. If we if the media, sorry I keep referring to we because I'm part of the media, if the media would disassociate itself from the issue of the bottom line, the editorial part of the media, and bring through to the common monarchy what the constitution says, what this institution stands for, then I think we would be in a better place to look at everything as far as the transition of this democratization process. And, 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 uh, I think... Sorry. I think it's really important that the conversation keeps circling back to the Constitution. I, 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 I really want to highlight this point. Because but do you not see the that there's already a disparity in the panel? Because um, one panelist sees that institutions are under assault, and then the other believes that um, institutions, there's a lack of trust. With, with uh, all due respect, <coughs> our job is not to trust institutions. It is institutions' job to earn our trust and to stand up to scrutiny. You don't, you don't walk in and say, because I am whoever, because I am the court, because I am IBC, because I am the executive, I hereby demand your trust. It's not demanded, it's earned. And this is a tremendous opportunity for all these institutions to earn <coughs> our trust. And what I'm loving about this conversation is we're starting off from a place of trust in the Constitution. And now I need the lawyers to earn our trust the lawyers who are interpreting this constitution. And I don't worry that different people are reading the same document and seeing different things. It is what happens with constitutions. It's why they're there. There's no country with a constitution where there aren't very different interpretations of the same document. It means we are mature. But what about the interpretations of the document um, according to political leanings? So that if you're, as we heard last night, mm -hmm. so that if you're, you know, jubilee aligned, you see the laws a certain way, and if you're NASA aligned, you see the And that's laws. where the institutions come in as referee. This is the referee, right? Of course, Jubilee ought to have their lawyers reading the thing this way. It's <coughs> NASA the other way. And that's where IBC needs to have its lawyers who realize that their job is referee. They're not a player in the game. They're not one of the teams. I they are the rest. I think, I think uh, the one, one, one group uh, who are not a problem and do not have a problem are lawyers. Because why? What's the job of a lawyer? The job of a lawyer is, depending on either just looking at the uh, uh, document called the Constitution and giving a broad-based interpretation, or, and this is quite legitimate, giving <coughs> an interpretation uh, to a constitutional provision that furthers 
the lawyer's client's cause. But at the end of the day, what is important is that we have a mechanism for arriving at, deci at, at a, a decision on that. I mean, we could spend, we could sit here the whole day, and I could, I, I'm one of those people who, uh, as, as, as a lawyer, did not um, uh, agree with, with the uh, decision of the Supreme Court on the presidential um, election petition. But that is, that is neither here nor there. What is important is that it is not me to make the decision, at the end of the day, it is the Supreme Court that made the decision, and at the end of the day, I and everybody else is obliged to respect the Supreme Court decision. But to tell us that we can't have different views in terms of interpreting the Constitution, I think would be too restrictive. And I think those, those, those uh, different things <coughs> would be important in shaping you know, the, the public discourse. I think one of the things that's evident is uh, you know, that there is need for uh, a lot of information you know, out there, that information needs to get out. Those viewpoints need to get out. And when you listened to uh, arguments for or against last evening, you know, they were they were convincing arguments. I think it, it's uh, and that's part of uh, uh, you know what happens in a, in a maturing democracy such as ours, having that space to be able to provide for different. But do we have the space? Because when Jerry, if you tell us that um, this transition period should last us about ten to fifteen years, yeah. um, what was the start point? of the transition period because you've given us clear markers as to when the um, preceding two periods started and can we withstand 15 years of this toing and froing, backing and forthing, you know, mutilation of the co uh, constitution? Do we have a choice but to stand and not just stand, survive and thrive and end at, come out of the end of these 10 to 15 years with when institutions? I, w I would time it as having have started after um, in the election that saw Uhuru take over from Kibaki. Now that's a really yes, that's a really important moment because the true mark of uh, of w one of the milestones you need to pay attention to is not the moment where you get rid of of the, the di dictator, if you will, of President Moy. That was not actually that key a moment. Saddam went. Uh, Gaddafi went. The key moment is actually when the person who took over from the dictator hands over power. So peaceful transition. That, uh, that peaceful transition after dislodging the dictator, that is when you mm -hmm. start the clock. And so, and that's a moment a lot of processes, a lot of countries never survive. Think about Egypt, think about Libya, think about um, Iraq. Um, Afghanistan are struggling. If you think globally, that transition is a critical one. So you start the clock there and you count 10 to 15 years. Namukileta Ujinga extends to 20 years. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, I was, I was going to say, you know, uh, I think we, we may start with a mindset that we have a crisis, and mm -hmm. that, that would be a problem. What if we started with the mindset of, uh, if you go to uh, 2013, or go, go, go back a little, it was in the middle of uh, an electoral cycle to 2010 when we have this constitution. The constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, compare that with the, with the 2007, we have what, is, what was indeed a crisis following an election. What, half the country says, you know what, we, we, we are not going to court because we, we have no faith in those courts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then the rest is history, you know what happened. Now. Fast forward to 2013, we have an electoral dispute, we go to court, mm -hmm. uh, go through the motions, the Supreme Court makes a decision. Like any other court case, one of the parties comes out feeling, you know what, I don't really agree, <coughs> I'm not very happy, but I accept it. Mm -hmm. To me, that is an indicator that mm -hmm. our institutions are working. Mm -hmm. Then, again, fast, mm -hmm. fast forward to uh, 2017. 2017, pretty much the same uh, thing happened. We, we have an electoral dispute. Uh, one of the parties uh, goes to court. Uh, Fourteen days later, they walk out of court. Uh, one of the parties uh, uh, feeling re really vindicated, they have got the victory that that took them to court. The other is saying, you know what, I totally disagree with you. And that's perfectly mm -hmm. legitimate. There are many people who disagree with court decisions all the time. But the important thing, and that's where we should focus to show that mm -hmm. we are not in a crisis. The important thing is, having said I totally disagree with, uh, with this, the important thing is, 
I will abide by it. So I will say to me, I work it. I work it. Um, this is some discontinuity, I think, on your part because okay. um, you're aligned with Jubilee, and what we have seen um, in the aftermath, and we've talked about it on this show um, before. What we have seen in the aftermath is um, a propaganda a smear campaign against um, the Supreme Court. We have seen um, a smear campaign against um, uh, NGOs that uh, have been supporting our judicial um, reforms. So it isn't really that um, people are agreeing to abide by it. We have seen an onslaught against institutions. We have seen a narrowing of space. And so when we come back to the point that yeah. Nancy Booker is talking about, financial models and, and revenues, um, you, you have seen that media houses have been threatened with, uh, with, 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 with their revenues um, being pulled, advertisements being pulled. So our institutions really working. You, you know, I'm in Jubilee, yes. But let's, let's, let's be, um, you know, uh, categorical here. What, what are we talking about? How do politicians react? By the way, I would like to... Do you to describe yourself as a politician even though you... No, I, you, don't, I don't describe Even that. though you um, you're went to the Senate seat. Uh, I know. I ordinarily don't describe myself as a politician. I am a member of the Jubilee Party. Politically, I support the Jubilee Party. But like I said last night, if you watched, I said first and foremost, I am a Kenyan. I am a lawyer, and then I am a member of Jubilee. I would hate to think that there will be a day when I will forget I am a Kenyan and that I am a lawyer, and just remember that I am a member of Jubilee. Now, you talked about uh, what was said about the. The, the, the Supreme Court and so on. The you know, network. You know, the Your political heart. class is a political class. If you take this, the speech by the Honorable Raila Odinga at, at the swearing in of Governor Joho in Mombasa and take the speech of President Uhuru Kenyatta immediately, the Supreme Court uh, uh, made the determination. Made, yeah, you would actually think they were reading from the same script. That's the reality. I mean, it's there. I mean, I mean you, you, can, you can write and you'll see. The thing is, Politicians are human beings. There's a, there's, a, there's a point at which they, they, they respond to the, the immediate uh, 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 challenge that they have first as human beings. But my point was, having said that, what was important in both cases, in 2013, Raila Odinga said, I don't agree with what the court has decided, but I accept it. In 2017, Uhuru Kenyatta said the same thing. I don't agree with what the Supreme Court has decided. I accept it. Let's go to an election. But what's happening in Parliament at the moment with the electoral laws? You see, there again, very good example, Udwak. We have a constitution. I do not understand why we would give the Supreme Court leeway to, to, to play out its constitutional role and not give Parliament the same leeway to play out its constitutional role, especially when we know if Parliament passes a law that is unconstitutional, Anybody, any citizen has uh, the, 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 the right and the ability to approach the High Court to declare that unconstitutional. So why are we not allowing Parliament to, to uh, play out its constitutional role as it sees it? You see, we, 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 are, we are trying to preempt that. Our institutions, and I would be curious to hear what uh, Dr. Njiro has to say as a political scientist. You see, our, our uh, institutions will work yeah if we give them room to work and we are not giving them a blank check there is no institution that is why we have a, a you know a political setup that uh, has checks and balances there is no institution that has uh, uh, a, a, a blank check parliament will pass laws which will be subjected to the constitutional test by by, 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 the, the, by the, 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 the supreme court, court. And the, the, the court also must uh, act in, 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 in interpreting the law. Uh, remember, at the end of the day, uh, other than what is in the Constitution, which will be interpreted by, by uh, the court, it is Parliament which makes the laws. So you have the Constitution which the people of Kenya passed. Under that Constitution, Parliament uh, will make laws. And the judiciary will interpret those laws and enforce the same laws. And so we are in a clear situation here. The onslaught against the judiciary by Jubilee is because the judiciary has not earned the trust of the Jubilee people. The onslaught against parliament by the NASA people 
as far as the electoral laws reforms are concerned is because parliament has not earned their trust so it goes back to what she was saying we are in a situation where these institutions have to earn the trust of the public for them to be able to take us through the transition but 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 uh, 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 my name's sake you know when, when when you look at look at parliament for example isn't it very interesting that there are times that parliamentarians will actually uh, close ranks salaries Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and that is precisely why they have not earned the trust of the public. Mm -hmm. The public looks at them and thinks every time they do anything, even if it's good for the people, there must be something hidden. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, 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 uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead, you know, just, just picking up from, from what uh, to the two gentlemen have, have raised is, you know, the whole question of, of winning the trust of the public. And I think we saw what happened uh, with the ruling by the Supreme Court, you know, for 2017 one, you know, which caught many people in mm -hmm. total surprise, you know, uh, for the first time people were even going to look at the meanings of certain words, what does null mean, because they would not imagine that that would happen. And so, uh, in a maturing democracy, I think we shouldn't worry too much about the current situation that we are in. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we just need to, there is a lot that we need to learn from it. And one of the things that media needs to do is move this discussion from he said, she said. Yeah. I think for me that's the greatest frustration when I turn on to any media, read any newspaper, it's, you know, what has the, what does Uhuru say, what does um, really? Raila say, what does Nasa say, what does uh, Jubilee say. There is a bigger debate that's going on here. There is a context, you know, that we shouldn't forget. Uh, Charles talks about 2007 to 2013. It goes back to the clamor for multi-party, you know, politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 90s, uh, it goes back to the Constitution and part of that history will help people understand what their role is I think for a number of the public we, we don't even understand our, our mandate our power in all this debate there's mm -hmm. such helplessness out there but yet we, we, so we let, let uh, Dr. Wanjiri speak we go on a break and then I'll yeah. come back to you I think there's, uh, there's a part of the conversation that I would also love to have uh, to have happen which is the role of professional the, the middle class that. and professionals mm -hmm. in this debate mm -hmm. and I think that media is part of contributing to this grade that you're giving I would say media has done a poor job of moving beyond pundits and, and loudmouths to actually bring in professionals. No, I mean, we, we, we do do it as if it's a, and it, it, it brings in the revenues, but the entertainment value, we're missing nutrition. And some of that nutrition is KEPSA. What's private, private sector? got to say mm -hmm. in the midst of all this we have speaking. a double tra taxation treaty that government just did the past with china signed with china what are the implications of that on our own nascent private sector as we're busy being bamboozled by politics with a small p we've been had policy okay. will actually need to run an economy are we going to are we passing policies that are going to be competitive and how what voices should we be drawing from the professionals to speak into not just this moment but the longer journey ahead okay uh, we'll take a break now uh, this is Cheche and we're live on Citizen TV our SMS number is double two four two two and you can reach us on Twitter using the hashtag Cheche tell us how you think the NASA pullout from the repeat election uh, affects our democracy